Let your guiding light in the night be KMOX Radio, the voice of St. Louis. This is the voice of John McCormick, the man who walks and talks at midnight. Airborne on your AM radio band, where that little light I spoke of shows up in your dial at 1120 Skyway Drive from 2400 hours until 0600. Certainly to keep you company throughout the night, but more important is to keep you thoroughly informed. KMOX. That's worth repeating. KMOX News. That's worth reporting. This is the world Saturday is of 0300 Central Standard Time. A man armed with hand grenades tried unsuccessfully to hijack a Korean Airlines plane to Communist North Korea today, then blew himself up after the plane made an emergency landing. Police said the unidentified man killed himself by exploding a grenade about a half hour after the ship landed on a sandy beach near Kon Song, 95 miles northeast of Seoul. The explosion injured 16 of the 60 passengers and crew members, five of them seriously, according to officials at National Police Headquarters in Seoul. In North Africa, a hijacked Ethiopian Airlines plane carrying 23 persons and manned by an American crew has landed at Benghazi, Libya. But there are unconfirmed reports the hijackers may force the DC-3 to fly on to the Libyan capital of Tripoli or the Mediterranean island of Malta, a member of the British Commonwealth. Radio reports from the Sudan, where a refueling stop was made, identify the hijackers as Eritrean students. But the Eritrean Liberation Front has denied responsibility for the hijack. Eritrea is an Ethiopian province. Meanwhile, a Northwest Airlines jet carrying 59 persons has landed at Miami after being diverted to Cuba on a flight from Milwaukee to Washington. In news from Vietnam, Viet Cong gunners have shot down two American helicopters 26 miles east of Saigon. Eight Americans were killed, three wounded. A small observation chopper was shot down and a larger Huey. They went to its aid, also was downed. In other news, back in this country, the American Tuna Boat Association reports another United States fishing vessel has been seized by Ecuador. This brings to 13 the number of American tuna boats hauled into Ecuadorian ports in the past 10 days. All have been charged with violating the country's disputed 200-mile fishing jurisdiction. The United States recognizes Ecuador's jurisdiction over only 12 miles of water from its shores. So far, Ecuador has collected more than half a million dollars in fines and licensing fees from the American vessels. Both Republicans and Democrats have praised the goal set forth last night in President Nixon's State of the Union address, but Democrats predict many of the proposals will face stiff opposition. The chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, Democrat Russell Long of Louisiana, noted that many of the proposals will have to originate in the House Ways and Means Committee, so it'll be a while before congressional action can be completed. Meanwhile, strong criticism has come from the president of the giant National Education Association. Helen Bain said the president's revenue sharing and government reorganization plans threatened to relegate education to its lowest level ever. And the president's State of the Union address incorporated some ideas that have been pushed by liberal Democrats in the so-called new left over the past few years. He renewed his call for welfare reform and proposed that some of the power which is accrued to the federal government be returned to state and local governments to the people. Mr. Nixon also promised legislative proposals to ensure better and more accessible health care for Americans. One big surprise was the amount of federal revenue Mr. Nixon suggested returning to lower levels of government. $16 billion, however only $6 billion of this would be new money. The other $10 billion would be diverted from existing federal programs. A United States District Judge up in Hartford, Connecticut has dismissed a suit brought by imprisoned at a war priest Philip and Daniel Berrigan. The Berrigan brothers had sought a temporary injunction prohibiting officials at the federal prison in Danbury from censoring or blocking their communications with the outside world. But Judge Emmett Clary ruled that the plaintiffs must face the fact that they have temporarily forfeited many of the rights associated with free men. On labor, the United Auto Workers Chrysler Council has voted to recommend ratification of a new three-year contract for production and maintenance workers at Chrysler. Meanwhile, negotiations continue on a pact to cover the 10,000 salaried Chrysler workers represented by the UAW. In news of the St. Louis area in the Show Me State of Missouri, a group of parents plans to demonstrate today at the offices of the Normandy School District they're protesting a closed hearing involving possible expulsion of their children. The students are among 93 who were suspended last November. Following disturbances at Normandy High School, some of the students have been suspended for the rest of the semester until January 25th. 
Meanwhile, the school board has been holding hearings on the possible expulsion of some of the offending students, and the parents object to the nature of the closed hearings. School board president Fred Cole said the sessions were closed in the interest of the students and their parents. Cobble said that hundreds of people, some for, some against the students, tried to attend, so the hearings were limited to those immediately involved in the outcome. A temporary injunction was renewed yesterday to keep 15 students and one non-student from disrupting classes at Normandy High. Mayor A.J. Savantes has rejected a petition calling for the repeal of a new city ordinance making the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King a public holiday in the city. A delegation from the National Council for White Civil Rights confronted the mayor with a petition yesterday, but the mayor said he regards King as a great man and feels the holiday will help maintain racial harmony in the city. Citizen cooperation with the St. Louis Crime Commission's Lock It and Pocket the Key campaign was largely responsible for the reduction in car thefts of nearly 10% last year. That's the opinion of the Commission's Auto Theft Subcommittee, which reports there were over 1,400 fewer car thefts last year than in 1969. Using the FBI estimate that a car theft cost the owner an average of $1,104, the Commission said the theft reduction saved St. Louis car owners about $1.5 million. A fire that started in the attic of a wooden A-frame dormitory swept through the building last night near the University of Missouri at Rolla. The building was leveled, and the loss was estimated at $40,000. Many of the students lost their belongings. All occupants escaped safely, with the exception of one minor injury. Funeral services are going to be held tomorrow in Cape Girardeau for former Missouri legislator J.S.N. Farquhar. Farquhar died in a St. Louis County nursing home yesterday. He was 86. For six decades, he operated a wholesale lumber business in Cape Girardeau. And Farquhar served as state legislator for 16 years, serving one term for Madison County beginning in 1921, and three terms as Cape Girardeau County Representative beginning in 1945. And funeral services are going to be held today for the man who served for nearly 30 years as city attorney for University City. It was Marvin Boisseau, who was city attorney from 1934 until 1962. He died at the age of 85. Services are going to be held at 4 this afternoon at the Church of the Holy Communion in University City. The news of the Land of Lincoln, the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, has asked a federal appeals court in Chicago to grant a so-called emergency injunction against two locals and a district council of the Carpenters Union in the East St. Louis area. Recently, federal district judge William Jurgens of East St. Louis refused to grant an injunction, barring what the government contends is interference with a minority hiring plan for Illinois highway construction projects. Finally, the United States Army has agreed to hold up the transfers of 613 employees to the Granite City Army Depot who have children in school. The employees were to have completed their transfers by April 1st, but a representative asked for a delay until the 1st of July so the children wouldn't have to spend the last few weeks of the term in a strange new school. Congressman Melvin Price of East St. Louis said the Army readily agreed to the delay. As of July 1st, the depot will be closed and another 817 employees terminated. And for the news to Saturday's sports page with Friday's result, last night there was just one game played on the ice of the National Hockey League. California Golden Seals defeated the Toronto Maple Leafs 5-2. to The St. Louis Blues will be back in action tonight, hosting the Buffalo Sabres at the arena. KMOX Radio or cast the game at 7.55. Jack Buck and Gus Kyle calling it from ringside. On the hardboard courts of the National Basketball Association, the Baltimore Bullets... Shot down the Boston Celtics, 136 to 117. Portland Trail Blazers, 123. Detroit Pistons, 112. Atlanta Hawks, 117. Milwaukee Bucks, 110. Los Angeles Lakers flooded out the San Francisco Warriors, 130 to 110. Philadelphia 76ers, 117. The Phoenix Suns, 116. And in overtime, Seattle Supersonics shaded the Cincinnati Royals, 132 to 131. Buffalo Bills, 101. San Diego Rockets, 94. There were no games scheduled in the American Basketball Association last night because they have an all-star game this afternoon that will be played in Greensboro, North Carolina. In college basketball, UCLA, 87. Loyola, Chicago, 62. Temple, 61. American University, 55. Cornell, 93. Bucknell, 65. Washington, 98. Missouri Valley College, 68. Concordia Seminary, 88. Blackburn, 75. Oklahoma City, 88. Miami, Florida, 75. Cincinnati, 73. And Iowa, 69. 
And so to the weather, and here's Sherry. 21 degrees in St. Louis and a weekend weather outlook of mostly sunny skies. The temperatures will be on the cool side mostly. The forecast is calling for clear skies overnight, but colder. Our morning low will be around 20. Today will be sunny but cold. Afternoon highs in the mid to upper 30s. Turning cloudy and cool tonight with a low in the mid 20s. And for Sunday, considerable sunshine and little temperature change. Highs once again in the 30s. Chances of measurable precipitation are 5% today and 10% tonight. In St. Louis, under clear skies, the relative humidity is 68%. Our winds are out of the west-southwest at 2 miles per hour, and the barometric pressure is 30 and 0700 inches, and it's rising. So it's a pair of sunny days ahead for St. Louis. Afternoon highs in the 30s, and that present St. Louis temperature, 21 degrees. That's the weather. Now, here's John. Nine and a half minutes past three, Central Standard Time. Now, nobody's saying it, but everybody knows it. There's really going to be a double rocket shot at the Cape. Sunday afternoon, January 31st. Because when Apollo 14 blasts off that launch pad, the specter of Apollo 13 is going to be riding right alongside all the way to the moon and back. I didn't want to talk about it, but I'm going to. Apollo 13, the whole hum moon trip that ended by carrying three men to the edge of disaster instead of the moon. The trouble began for the 13 crew long before they ever got off the ground. Most people have forgotten about that one, the great measles scare. Astronaut Thomas Mattingly, selected as command module pilot for Apollo 13, was indirectly exposed to measles. He'd been in steady contact with another astronaut whose youngster caught the virus. The space doctors discovered that Mattingly had no immunity. He was pulled out of the crew just days before the launch on the 11th of April. They were afraid he'd break into spots 200,000 miles out in space. Decided against taking any chances. NASA grabbed astronaut Jack Swigert from the Apollo 14 backup crew to replace the unhappy Mattingly. Even though he'd been following the training of the Apollo 14 crew, Swigert still had to take a crash course in certain aspects of the job ahead. And so that was hitch number one in the routine so necessary to a smooth Apollo performance. The men who surveyed the Apollo 13 failure believe they've dealt with a disease exposure problem by putting the Apollo 14 astronauts into semi-quarantine at the Cape and restricting the number of persons who may have contact with them. Or they can see their wives, but not their children. Youngsters are too often the carriers of various ailments. There are 160 persons at the Cape who have reason to work with the astronauts as the launch time approaches. The doctors have checked on every one of them their health background and their general health. Each one must immediately tell the medics if he's exposed to any disease or ailment. In that case, he has to stand behind a glass panel to communicate with the astronauts. And the air in the astronaut quarters is filtered. This is still another effort to hold down the germ factor in their immediate vicinity. So that takes care of Apollo 13 hitch number one. Hitch number two again forgotten by most of those who clearly remember the major Apollo 13 accident. In launch, Commander James Lovell reported terrific vibrations in the second stage boost from the Saturn V. The pogo effect was so great that it turned off one of the five engines in the second stage. Fortunately, the other four tubes increased power, as they were supposed to, and put the spacecraft on its correct track. But it could have been different. And like other things about Apollo 13, this was a first. The Saturn rocket people believe they have solved that one by changing the fuel flow into the rocket tubes. The modification has been made on the giant rocket, waiting to carry 14 into space. Then came the biggest, most dangerous hitch of all. The one that announced to the world by command module pilot Jack Swigert, who told Houston, Hey, we've got a problem here. The world wasn't really listening when Swigert spoke those words 200,000 miles out in space. It's become sort of bored with the whole shooting match. 
people asking out loud whether this trip was really necessary. But they'd started listening then and learned finally that an oxygen tank had overheated and blown up in the command service module, that the oxygen had also drained from the number two tank, endangering the electrical supply and the oxygen breathing supply as well. The oxygen tanks are part of a system that supplies power, breathing oxygen, and water. The Apollo 13 astronauts managed to get home because their lunar module was still attached to mothership, giving them the needed power and oxygen. And they had tough going at times, but technical know-how pulled them through. But after the investigation told what happened, the question became, how do you keep it from happening again? The space experts decided for one thing, they'd try to dream up a similar accident under the worst possible circumstances. They say that would be if a tank blew while the mothership was behind the moon and a lunar module was on the moon. The LM could rendezvous with the command module in lunar orbit, but there would be no reserves in the LM to take them home. This is the solution worked out by the Apollo planners. They have fireproofed the two oxygen tanks in every way they can think of. They added a third oxygen tank to the command service module, separated from the other two. Then they added a battery. Thus, if the main oxygen tanks ever went out again, the third tank could supply oxygen for breathing, while the 400 amper battery would supply at least enough power to get back to Earth. They say an emergency trip back would be austere, but it could be done. There are, of course, two types of emergencies with no way out. Failure of the command ship's main engine, while the command module and lunar lander are locked together in moon orbit. Also failure of the LEM takeoff engine while on the moon. But the spacemen believe that the faults of Apollo 13 have been corrected. Command module pilot Stuart Russo called Apollo 14 a safer spacecraft. The LM pilot Edgar Mitchell made the comment that there is still some possibility of a problem, but it's pretty small. The commander Alan Shepard expressed his confidence with the remark, we're looking forward to flying. However, Al Shepard had some remarks to make out California last summer that he does not think too highly of this particular blast off. That's due to the drawback in the space funds. And Shepard has been in space just once. He made the first United States suborbital flight 10 years ago. But the ear ailment of which we spoke the other morning kept him grounded until now. On his trip to the moon, Shepard said, we're pretty confident that things are going to go well. But he added, we don't try to kid ourselves about the dangers. It cost $15 million to make the modifications in the Apollo systems, and it could cost the whole manned space program if by some terrible chance they didn't work. The Apollo launch director said, if Apollo 14 doesn't go well, we may not have a future at all. Apollo 14 has got to be a perfect mission. And I mean perfect. And of course, radio is going to take you there. And I figure we've come a long way from Kitty Hawk. Thank you.